Good morning, everyone. Um, hope everyone's doing well. I was just alerted we were having a couple internet issues um, here, but um, hopefully you all could uh, see and, and hear me. And I just wanted to, to welcome you all to Orange County Water District's webinar. My name is Matt Apollywall, and um, we are going to uh, talk a lot today about our recharge operations uh, team and the, and the role that they play to ensure our local groundwater basin here in Orange County continues to thrive. So our team has uh, spent the summer working hard to prepare for the potential of fall and winter storms with the goal of maximizing stormwater capture from the Santa Ana River and enhancing storage water, I'm sorry, enhancing storage opportunities in our basins, all while preventing flood damage to our homes and businesses, a very, very critical uh, a role that they play. And um, before we begin, I would like to mention that we are in webinar mode, uh, so attendees are muted to reduce background noise. Uh, the webinar is being recorded uh, and will be available on the OCWD website and YouTube channel. And we'll take questions at the end of our presentation. So we do encourage you to submit your questions in the Q&A box located at the bottom of your screen. And during the Q&A portion, we will do our best to address questions most relevant to the uh, topic and the information presented today. In the event that we're not able to get to your question during the time frame allotted, uh, we are happy to follow up with you after uh, the webinar and provide you with the response. So if possible, please do include your contact information uh, and email address. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce our speakers for today. Uh, Ben Smith is the Director of Recharge and Wetland Operations for the Orange County Water District. He is responsible for the management and oversight of the operations and staff of the field headquarters, often referred to as the Four Bay and Prado areas, which includes the recharge facilities and the Prado constructed wetlands. And Don Houlihan is the district's recharge operations supervisor, where he oversees efforts such as optimizing system percolation, stormwater capture and routing, imported and recycled water recharge and other related activities. And you'll hear more about the entire recharge operations team. Um, so I will go ahead and uh, hand it over to Ben to get us started. Oh, and Ben, you're good. on, go. Got it, got it, thanks. Uh, good morning, everybody. Welcome to our webinar. Um, so I'm Ben Smith and um, we're starting out here with a beautiful picture from one of our staff members took. This is sunrise on the Santa Ana River. And you can see here at a rubber dam. This is what we call the Imperial Rubber Dam. Back here, these pillars, this is a trash rake system uh, where this is location where we first take water off the river. But it's a beautiful photo. One of our staff members captured. <clears throat> so who does this work? I like to acknowledge our our staff, there's 21 individuals uh, that work in Anaheim and Prado, up, up behind Prado Dam. Uh, they do the work to move the water around to uh, operate the heavy equipment, to maintain the grounds and maintain the equipment and do the administration. We have 28 pieces of heavy equipment, things like bulldozers, scrapers, uh, excavator backhoes. We have a uh, a handful of on-road vehicles, so of course pickup trucks for the staff, but also water trucks, um, dump trucks, and things of that nature. Boats, trailers, pumps. None of this is possible without these people, though. So here's a picture of the Santa Ana River watershed. So, uh, you know, Orange County Water District's down here at the, the bottom of the watershed. The river comes through Orange County. Uh, Prado Dam we'll be talking quite a bit about today, um, but you can see the watershed extends up into three different mountain ranges, San Gabriel, San Bernardino, and San Jacinto Mountains. Uh, we don't, it's rare we get water out of the San Jacinto area, um, but Big Bear Lake, you know, is a, a good reference point for the start of the Santa Ana River in that direction. So again, today we'll focus mostly uh, in our Anaheim orange uh, recharge facilities, but we will talk a little bit about the Prado Dam as well. So for those who are new to the industry, um, we're gonna talk about water in this volume unit of acre feet. Um, so if you can picture one acre 
one foot deep. That's an acre foot. So it's approximately a football field, one foot deep. And so you can see that's 326,000 gallons. Uh, it's enough water for a family of four for about, um, I'm sorry, half, half an acre foot is enough for a family of four for a year. So here's a simplified graphic of the groundwater basin. So I wanna start at the bottom here. Uh, the water demands above the basin, 77% of them are being met with groundwater. So this symbol here, this old school well pump uh, symbolizes the water agencies, our, our customers. So city of Anaheim or Mesa Water District or those kind of agencies taking water out of the ground and serving it to their customers. And one of our missions here, we balance, uh, we put water back into the ground. So we have several sources to do that. One, we buy untreated import water from the Metropolitan Water District. Nature does a big chunk for us. Um, rainfall goes down and percolates without uh, our management of it. We also have the world-renowned groundwater replenishment system producing water that is recycled wastewater, gets put into the ground. And over here on the right, we have the river coming down. So we have two, we break that water into two sources, base flow and storm flow. And I'm gonna overcomplicate this slide here. On an average year, the amount of water we try to get into the ground is 352,000 acre feet. That matches the 77% demand. So we, on an average year, we try to balance in and out. If you break that number down into percentages, you can see where each source comes from. So 18% on average import water, 17% nature. Out of that GBRS plant, if I, I pulled the data for the last few years, about two thirds of that water comes up to our four bay recharge facility. The other third is going to um, the injection wells. So that, that's the project to keep the ocean water out and also the mid basin injection project. And then you can see 15 and 20. So 35% of the water is coming down the river being recharged. If you add, add up all those numbers, it's about 257,000 acre feet of surface recharge we're doing each year. So here's our facilities. This is at the border of Anaheim and Orange. You see the river coming down here in the center. <clears throat> so the district owns about 1,600 acres of land in this space. They own more in other places. Of that, just under 1,100 acre feet we call wet acres, meaning that's where the water would touch and be recharged. So that's about 68% of the land. The other portion of the land uh, is used for maintenance rows mostly, uh, but we have some equipment yards and some other facilities as well. If you count up the different lakes, which we call basins, there's about 26 of them. If you add up all the storage everywhere, it's 25,000 acre feet of storage. We use 11, more than 11 miles of pipe to move water between the lakes. We have 11 different pump stations, four rubber dams. So these are dams that get inflated with air and they can be deflated uh, very quickly. So we have two of those in the Santa Ana River, these black lines here. So we dam up the river to divert, to get the water to you know, make a right-hand turn into our facilities. So there's two there. There's one in the Carbon Creek uh, at what's called La Jolla Basin. And there's also one here at the end of our Warner Basin. And then we have three leases, um, three tenants that have businesses based off water being at their facilities. Uh, one is a fishing business here at Warner Lake. One is a uh, aqua park here at Miraloma. And one is a golfing type business, driving range um, down here at the end of Burris. Um, so operation of those businesses um, impacts how we have to manage the water. So this being also discussing 
the flood facilities. So I wanted to point out what flood facilities were involved with. So up here at the top right off the chart um, is Prado Dam. So Prado Dam's owned and operated by the Army Corps of Engineers. Its primary purpose is to prevent flooding in Orange County. And I'll go into this in more detail, but we have an arrangement where they can capture and store stormwater for us. And we work with them on the release rates from the dam. There's also the Santa Ana River. So the district owns about six miles of the river, but of course it is a flood conveyance uh, facility. So our primary thing in the river that would impede flood performance is those rubber dams. And so we, uh, there's different, there's flexibility in the operation of those rubber dams, but essentially they have to get dropped if we see a flow more than 1300 CFS in the river. So we drop those dams so we do not back water up in the river and cause flooding. There's also basins that OCWD doesn't own, but we do uh, partial operation of. So there's Miller Basin, Placentia, Raymond, and Fletcher Basins in the city of Orange. And so these are owned by the County of Orange, uh, Public Works Flood Control, but we have joint use of those facilities. So basically in the summer, we can use them how we please. And in the winter, we're limited. Uh, their primary functions are for flood control and so our operations for recharge would be limited during those times. And then coming through uh, Villa Park and Orange, there's the Santiago Creek. And over there, we have our largest facilities um, in terms of storage. That's the, what we call the Santiago Basins. And so this creek, uh, it flows out of the Santa Ana Mountains, um, the west side of them. So Irvine it would hit the water would hit Irvine Lake and then Villa Park Dam and then make its way down to us at Santiago Basins. So these basins are directly connected with the creek. So for any flow upstream to go downstream, these basins would have to be completely full. There, the lower part of Santiago Creek does flow. That's um, local inflow. Usually, it. It's rare that we're brim full at these facilities. Okay, so a little more about Prado Dam. So this is, you know, an oversimplification of the dam. <clears throat> and behind the dam, the current spillway elevation is 543 feet. Uh, the Army Corps is working on a project right now to raise that spillway um, with the County of Orange. And I wanna say that's about 20 feet foot increase um, they are working on right now. But at this moment, it's 543. So if you add up all the capacity below that, that's 217,000 acre feet uh, possible storage. That does include a conservation piece I'll talk about in a minute and also sediment accumulation. Over the life of a dam, you expect sediment to fill part of it, uh, and so you can't store as much water because the sediment would be occupying that volume. The magic elevation for us is 505, and what that equates to is about 20,000 acre feet of storage. So we have an arrangement with the Army Corps uh, and other entities um, to be able to store water in the dam up to 505. And so if you can picture a storm event, right? You, we saw that huge watershed above Prado Dam. That all drains down to the dam. When it's raining and storming, we ask Prado Dam to limit the, the outflow and to build this pool up, this um, storage. And that's because downstream, we are getting local inflow from the storm as well. And so we wanna capture and put into storage and percolate all of that local inflow that we can. Um, try not to let anything go to the ocean. Then when the storm's over and the local flow stops, then we ask the Army Corps to increase discharges from the dam to drain this pool. 
And we set a goal to drain that pool as quickly as we can. Most of it goes into storage in our facilities. A lot of it is percolating. That happens 24-7. Um, and the concept here in getting the pool empty as quickly as we can is that maybe there's another storm coming and that can refill this storage. So in a good year, we would get two storms. In a great year, three storms, uh, sorry, three pools. Um, last year was pretty dry. We had one pool, so. Speaking to which, uh, here's a history of rainfall. Uh, we have our own rain gauge in Anaheim. That, that's this data. It averages about 14 inches, uh, but as you can see, there aren't many average years, right? There's a lot of years under and a couple super years um, kind of produces this average. So last year we were just under seven inches. This coming year we are, the predictions are for a drier winter, um, but we are prepared to receive whatever nature will give. So this chart is loaded with data. I'm gonna try to do, go over it quickly. But this is meant to show the last year of our performance, uh, how we operate. So let me start at the top or, or the axes here. The left axis, this is acre foot. Um, what we're showing here is storage. So basically how full our lakes are. On the right is inches for the rainfall, the green line. So at the top, this is our maximum storage amount. You see the dips. That's due to the joint facilities with flood control that during the winter we have less flexible use of those facilities in the summer more flexible use. And so this next thick blue line, this is our actual storage, what we, how we operated our system. So you can see back in October, this region was shaded. A uh, shaded region means we were accepting import water. So storage was building because we were accepting those recharge waters. I'm sorry, those import waters. Um, and somehow we timed it great and uh, that delivery stopped and then it started significantly raining. You see the green lines here, the rain picking up. This orange line is storage at Prado Dam. So you see when it rained, how quickly Prado Dam storage picked up, right? And then there was a break. What was happening here in the decline, we're trying to drain that pool. And you see our line, the thick blue one, you know, skyrocketing. We're draining that pool into our facility, plus any local inflow we could grab. You see it rain again. The Prado pool picks way up. Uh, it would max out here at about 20,000. Uh, the reason uh, this was right around Christmas time last year, the the Army Corps was forecasting an even larger storm than arrived. Um, so they they managed to that, you know, more severe possibility. Uh, otherwise, if they weren't predicting such a severe storm, we probably would have seen this peak up at 20,000. Um, so you can see um, the rain stopped in December <clears throat> and you see the decline in the Prado pool and you see it a lot of that going into our storage, but again, a lot is percolating also at the same time, maybe 1,600 acre feet a day percolating. And we peaked out, and then uh, ever since, there's been a little, couple little rain events, but basically we've been percolating, getting ready for the next storm season where we are today. Um, just briefly, this blue dash line, this is our largest facility, that Santiago Basin. So it, this, the dark blue line includes this dash line. Um, we just show the dash line because it is our largest player in the equation. And again, so uh, these are import, the shaded region. So we actually ordered some import water in April. Met wasn't able to perform that delivery until June, July. Um, so we received 3,000 acre feet there. And you'll see right here at the beginning of October, we started a delivery again of import water. Um, and we're expecting that to come through December again. The reason 
we don't take import water in the summer is they charge an extra fee during the summer. So we're able to save about a million dollars a year by not um, taking that import water during the summer. So with that, I'll, I'll turn it over to Don. Don's going to go into some more details. Thank you, Ben. Thank you. Uh, yeah, so what I'll be talking about is uh, how we prepare for the storm season. And I just give you a little bit of brief uh, background on our, our facilities and a little bit more detail on the different parts of our facilities. So our system is primarily gravity flow. We do have a the GWRS, the recycled water from Fountain Valley is piped up here and is pressurized, uh, but 99% of our system is gravity flow. And it also has a lot of surface flow activity. Uh, and that is, be, I'll explain a little bit in a little bit about the Santa Ana River and how dirty that water is. We have one transfer pump station, which is located at our Burris Basin. And it travels up four and a half miles up to Santiago Basin. And that lift is actually 100 feet in elevation. So it's a large 66 inch pipe. And we could move 400 acre feet a day up into that bigger facility. So Burr's Basin holds 2,600 acre feet. And the, Burr, the Santiago Basins hold 14,000. So that's how important that uh, that transfer pump station is because we have that storage up there and you know we will get that uh, upper Santiago Creek runoff from local storms but the bulk of those those basins get filled from that transfer pump station. Uh, we have 10 dewatering pumps. Uh, every one of our recharge basins has a, a, a submersible pump uh, sump in it with multiple pumps that sit underwater and, and you'll see the need for uh, us to dry out our basins, do maintenance in a little bit. Uh, our water sources, they're limited to where the water can be sent. And I'll explain that in a little bit. So next slide, please. Oh, go ahead, Ben, show us the river, please. So the Santa Ana River accounts for 25% of our percolation. So that, that source for the Santa Ana River is 100% uh, base flow and storm flow during events. So where you see the, the, the river stop at the bottom of the screen, that's, that's how far we manage the river to. So our goal is to not let any water pass that point of the river. So if you do see water down past that point, typically it's gonna be local runoff uh, to uh, any uh, tributary that goes into our system below that second rubber dam that we have up, up, up Ben, you might, yeah, okay. So yeah, there's that rubber dam. So our two, our last control point of our system in the river is that, that rubber dam. So we manage how much water we send past there to ensure that it percolates before it gets to the end of our uh, workable area of the river. All right, thank you, Ben. So next is the upper off river system. And as Ben pointed out, at Imperial Dam, that's our headworks. That's the first place we're able to divert, di uh, divert water off the Santa Ana River. So we could, we could do uh, sustained flows of 350 CFS off the river there, uh, but we can do 500 during short periods. So with storm flow, you have peak events. So you don't know quite what you're going to get until you get it. So we will go up to a, a higher rate for a short period of time. But that off-river system, upper off-river system, it, it's, it's a series of desilting basins, which that, what that means is the water goes into this basin and it kind of, uh, it, it gets slowed down and then it surface transfers uh, to multiple different basins. And that surface transfer allows time for all that silt and clay that's suspended in the Santa Ana River water to fall out. And what you'll find out later, I'll show you later, is that that, that material 
we try to remove it through these desilting before we send it to our recharge basins. Uh, and the reason is that it accumulates in clogs and, and uh, prevents percolation from occurring. So next section. So now this is a lower aquifer system, and this is 100% SAR water, Santa Ana River water. And this is, this is another 15% of our percolation from the Santa Ana River flow. So we operate this during the storm season. We, uh, we leave these basins, we, we wanna end the season with them full as possible. And these are the key uh, contributors to keeping that conservation pool down at Prado uh, during the storm season. So we could vacate as much water for them to capture more storms. Our local runoff is just a, 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 a minuscule compared to what they capture behind Prado. So we do capture local here, but the bulk of the water is being conserved by Prado, Prado Dam. Um, next slide, please, Ben. All right, so the next one is Warner system. And that system is where Ben mentioned we have the fishing concessionaire and that basin is used they're, they're deeper basins and they're also used for desilting. So we do have fishing that we accommodate, but at the same time, the primary benefit of those basins is to take more of the, give the water time to let those silts fall out. And you'll see a slide later of what the accumulation of those silts over time looks like. Next slide, Ben, please. Next, we have the upper system, which water, there's three sources of water that could reach uh, the upper system. The aqua, there's two basins that are slightly different in color. Those basins are able to take three sources of water. They're able to take the recycled water, the GWS water from Fountain Valley, which is piped up. And then also they could take Santa Ana River water, which is that very, very dirty water, uh, but it's free. So uh, those also could take that water and they also could take imported water. Now imported water could be uh, delivered right there where the cursor is and it could it's sent down to all those other basins. So those other three, the, those four basins in the blue can get Santa Ana River water or the imported waters. Next slide, please. All right, so next is a GWRS system. Uh, basins, and those two basins are dedicated to only GWRS water. I mentioned that the two next to them are able to also take GWRS water, but as we go through these slides, you're going to find out that there's a, a little bit of a shell game that needs to occur to dewater those basins when GWRS water is in there. All right, thank you, Ben. Uh, so what we do for preparing for the storm season you know, uh, the, the rainy season is October 15th through April 15th. And our preparation, it says the end of season, but it really means the end of the last drop of water that comes from the Prado Dam. So once we're done draining that Prado Dam, we're already starting to schedule uh, the you know, when we, we're more pretty confident that that's the last storm, we'll start scheduling our cleaning. So uh, things that come into play are bird nesting. Uh, that nesting season starts March 1st and it goes through September 15th. Those dates kind of move depending on when the birds show up. Next, we'll have the strategic dewatering, basin cleaning, and then work in the Santa Ana River facility maintenance. And uh, then ultimately we'd like to uh, receive and percolate import water before the next uh, rainy season. That's our goal. Uh, during the season, you know, we're operating that burst pump station and also the Prado release rates. We have a, a working uh, relationship and the Army Corps of Engineers has uh, done uh, above and beyond uh, 
their efforts to help us conserve water in Southern California. So we're very grateful for that. Uh, the dozer work in the river is continuous. It's limited during the summertime for the bird nesting, but it's imperative that we continue working through the, uh, the winter months. The reason being is uh, if you've ever walked in, a, you look at a stream and it's very clear and you can see it, the bottom, and then all of a sudden take a step in there and all this uh, cloudiness comes up. Well, that's the resuspension of all the fines that had settled on the bottom. The dozer work uh, actually keeps the, uh, the solids suspended and the velocity of the water carries it down. So in our recharge area, it keeps the bottom clean so the water can percolate. Next slide, please. So scheduling was our first, uh, as soon as that uh, Prado pool, conservation pool was uh, drained, we started immediately on the, the basin cleaning schedule. So this past year, the 2021-22 year, uh, there was low amounts of rainfall, Ben mentioned under seven inches, half of the average. And it happened early, it happened in December, that the big event happened in December. So because we were prepared for that, uh, the season, we were able to vacate and drain that pool uh, by February. So we were able to start uh, our dewatering and our strategies to get ready for the next season earlier this year than normal. Uh, the bird nesting was limited, was more than usual. Uh, typically when you have a, a wet spring, then you have a lot more vegetation growth and then you'll have the bird nesting. So the birds kind of work with the weather. Uh, this time we had a drier than normal uh, springtime. And uh, then we did get an early start to the import and we have all the, red, uh, the basins ready to go for this next season. Next slide, please. So I spoke about strategic dewatering, the water supply limitations on which basins the water can be recharged. So the GWRS water is extremely clean and uh, it has the highest percolation rates, uh, meaning that it makes it into the groundwater basin faster than uh, the other two uh, uh, sources of water. The, the GWRS is limited to four basins, so that requires strategy. There's a four month detention time required before it reaches a production well. So what that means is we could, right now, we could only put that water in the ground where it'll take at least four months underground before it gets pumped out by one of the producers. Uh, imported water is our second uh, supply that I'm gonna talk about. And that can only be recharged in basins that can be desiccated, dried out, because of the Colorado River water, uh, it contains the invasive species, the coaga mussel. So, uh, you know, through these uh, recent uh, last 10 years, we've kind of gotten um, a couple of different strategies that we've had to adjust to. One was the bird nesting uh, and also the coaga mussel. Now, the Santa Ana River is our third source of water, which is our main source. Uh, and Ben did uh, mention that that is base flow and that's upstream effluent uh, water treatment plant effluent water uh, during most of the year. And then you do have the storm events and uh, the conservation pool that gets captured behind Prado. Now that uh, water is inherently uh, has high TSS, suspended solids. So that silt uh actually is a clogging element in our basin so an accumulation of that all that deposition ultimately will uh become the that surface between the the ground and the the water surface becomes less permeable so uh it our percolation our percolation rates will actually slow down and that's what indicates when we need to clean the basins Next slide, Ben. So here's a, a example of the strategic dewatering. 
Um, you can see uh, the, the hydraulic gradient for our uh, groundwater basin is southwest. So at the bottom of the screen, you see MA, which is Mini Anaheim Lake. And next to it, you see our imported water uh, uh, terminus right there. Now, the water that is in all those basins, it's going in the ground, but it's going southwest. The direction underground is southwest. So our strategy has to be the Anaheim Lake needs to be dewatered only. It, it gets the imported water, remember, and it's Santa Ana River water only in this basin and the mini Anaheim Lake also. Those, those basins, when we de we'll dewater that one first and that gets dewatered down to Miller then and Kramer and our three downstream basins, which is La Jolla, Placentia and Raymond basins. And uh, Miller, uh, Raymond and Placentia are flood control. So we do have limited use during the winter time, uh, but we're able to dewater Anaheim Lake and Mini Anaheim into those basins. Now next you'll see Miller and Kramer basins. Those two are the basins that are able to take all three sources of water. Now, when we have Santa Ana River water or imported water in, we'll dewater Kramer Basin. So imagine Anaheim Lake is drained and Minnie is drained. Next, Kramer will be drained and we drain it into Miller and then the three downstream basins are available for that dewatering. Unless there's GWS water in that basin. If we have a mix of GWS water in that basin, it will go to Miller only. And the same goes for Miller. We'll, we'll, drain, we'll drain and dewater Miller last, and that will go downstream to all those downstream basins. So now you can imagine all those three basins being empty and either being cleaned or drying, ready to be cleaned. Uh, you see the LP La Palma Basin and Miraloma Basin. Those are our two dedicated GWRS basins. So that's the only source water that goes into those two basins. And that gets piped from Fountain Valley GWRS plant. Uh, next slide, please, Ben. So I spoke about the, the Santa Ana River water and the silt and how you get the deposition of that silt. It, all, the, all the fines get settled down to the bottom. A lot of your percolation is occurring at the bottom. But over time, the silt lays down and it creates that, that layer, that non-permeable layer. And this is to the right is what it looks like when it dries. It's like potato chips. And it's, it's just the silt, the clay. Once you remove the water, it shrinks and then it cracks. So this is something what it looks like, the silt buildup. You don't get that from the, we don't get that from the imported water, the GWRS water. But, you know, imagine these slopes, the banks around these basins, imported water and GWRS water, we do get some of those fines that make its way to the bottom and clog it. It's not as fast, doesn't happen as fast, but what happens is the when the water is in the, the basin, any wind will go against the bank and pull the fines out. So if you've ever been to a, a lake and you see a real clean band of sand around at a certain elevation, the, the likelihood is that the, the, the water elevation was there for a period of time. And over time, the wind went and it resuspended all the fines and left behind all the, the sand. And that's how that occurs. Next slide, please, Ben. So uh, the next thing is basin cleaning. And so uh, our goal is to clean the basins with, uh, <clears throat> and remove as little material as possible, but also getting as much of the clogging layer as possible. So on the left, you see a, a bulldozer that's uh, going up a slope of the basin. And we do get deposition, uh, uh, I mean, you know, the silts do actually go on that slope. That's about a three to one slope. It'll settle, but the bulk of the silt really settles on the bottom. So this dozer is going up the side and it's just trying to skim just that little bit 
of uh, uh, the the silt material, and also uh, it removes is the badge also. So in the center, uh, to the right is a motor grader, which is a piece of equipment that's used for fine leveling. We use it to just skim just that, you know, that quarter to half inch off the top that where all those, uh, all the silt is laying on top of. Uh, the one, the picture in the center is actually a, a scraper, a paddle wheel scraper, which it comes by and it picks up the windrows that the motor grader uh, produces. So you can see that, you can see the difference between the sand and where the chips are. And uh, that's what we like, we like to see when we're done cleaning. Next slide, please. So we do have some cleaning challenges that uh, we, we encounter. Uh, what you're seeing here is an extreme uh, case of that. I referenced uh, some of our deeper basins, the Warner system that is used for uh, primary use is desilting, you know, uh, dropping out those uh, fines. We clean this about every five years. Uh, and you can see that it, it, it doesn't dry out in the summertime very well. So we got to go in there and move that muck around. Uh, but like I said, this is, uh, we, we had those desilting ponds that do have a, a large amount of accumulation. So those don't get cleaned every year. Our basins get cleaned once to twice a year. Next slide, please. Along with uh, the, when we do drain some of our basins, uh, the Miller and Kramer and uh, Anaheim Lake, along with the desilting Warner system, we do get uh, dead fish. We, uh, ben mentioned we have a fishing consensia, con, uh, lisi that uh, stocks with fish. Uh, these small fish on the left, those are shad, and those uh, just come naturally down the Santa Ana River. And uh, some the, the bottom right is a sturgeon that uh, didn't make it through the cleaning. So, uh, but yeah, so we do have this happen once about once every five years where it's a, a fish die off that we have to clean up. Next slide, Ben. So the next is we work in the Santa Ana River. And I mentioned that we have bird nesting uh, concerns. We work with the natu our natural resources department, which we have a full-time biologist that comes down here and checks for bird nests and clears work to be done. So a summertime with no uh, work done in this particular stretch of the river, the top right, it shows a lot of vegetation. Uh, it doesn't stop the water from percolating in the ground. It does, you know, present challenges for cleaning. Uh, but we work with the biologist as soon as uh, a section is cleared for us to go in there and clean because the nesting has either completed or uh, there is no nesting in there. We'll go. The dozers will go in there. Uh, on the top right, you'll see the big A in the background. So we work down the river as far as Anaheim Stadium. And uh, the, the dozer in the river right there is just building some of the uh, TNL levees that you'll see in the bottom left. Now those levees are built in certain sections of the river to help us manage. I mentioned that we our last control point is three miles from the end of the river. So this helps us spread the water out across the whole, otherwise the water will channelize. So between them leveling on the bottom right picture, ultimately they'll build these TNL levees and the water will spread out. And on the, the more contact with the surface uh, gives more chance for percolation to occur. Uh, the dozers do run in the river uh, as much as possible because it does help that sediment, that suspended uh, silt, it, it'll, it'll help flush it, flush the river. Next slide, please, Ben. So next is our maintenance. So this is huge. We have uh, the top left is our burrs pump station. It shows four pumps. And I spoke about how important those that just transfer pump station is. It'll, it'll pump 400 acre feet a day up to that 
Santiago basins that could hold 14,000 acre feet. So it's very important for us to uh, maximize these pumps and get as much of that storm capture up to Santiago Basin where we have the storage. Uh, at the bottom photo, bottom left, that is, uh, you can see that that's a pump sump and there's a pump on a crane. Uh, these are activities that we have to do uh, in the summer before the rainy season because you can't get to these pumps when the basin's underwater. So the maintenance group will either replace pumps, they'll change the oil on the pumps and they'll do any maintenance. So then when we're ready to dewater at the end of the storm season, we have pumps to dewater with. Uh, the top right is uh, another uh, valve that actually is under the water level. So we can't access these during uh, the winter time. So we, the maintenance gets in there and they actually do maintenance during the summertime on the, all the valves and meters that are uh, submerged underwater during the winter. The bottom right, uh, these are uh, highly critical. They're surge tanks for the pumps that are on the top left. I, I mentioned that we pump from the Burr's pump station, that transfer station, 100 feet in elevation and four and a half miles of pipeline to the Santiago basins in the, camp, the city of Orange. If there is any kind of pump stoppage uh, from a power failure or um, anything like that, that water, that column of water wants to come back down the hill, down that 100 feet in elevation. These surge tanks are designed to absorb that shock so then it doesn't cause any damage to the pumps or the pipeline. Next slide, please. So some more maintenance, uh, facility maintenance that takes place is, uh, the top left is a stilling well that was fabricated by our maintenance department. And inside that stilling well, we have a level sensor. And that level sensor is associated with flow rate. So I haven't mentioned, but we have different flow devices that we measure flow. And they were able to install this. So then we're gonna be able to measure the flow that's going over the weir on the other side of that wall. Uh, all, the, all the level sensors and flow, flow meters are all, uh, we, we have telemetry on all that. So that comes back to our, our office and also allows us to control the whole system on a laptop computer from anywhere. Uh, the two pictures in the center are uh, one of the rubber dams that's deflated. And what happens is when we have those down during the summertime, because we don't need to run them up, the flows are so low, uh, silt the deposition goes on top of them. So we'll remove that before we inflate it. And then the bottom picture is uh, one of our guys inspecting the dam after it got inflated. You can see it's dry on both sides. So this is during the summertime uh, and making sure that everything looks good and works properly prior to rain events. Because once rain comes and we get in the wet season, we can't do these uh, maintenance items. So the, top, the, the right picture is the trash rack at our Imperial head gates, our first diversion point, highly critical. That's a claw trash rack system. It lowers in the water and it grips the trash and brings it out. Our number one source of trash is algae actually. And we get, we get some logs from some of the trees that uh, fall into the river upstream. We have about 10 miles of river, natural river between Prado Dam and our headworks. So during, if you have low flows a lot, and then all of a sudden you get one high flow, a lot of loose items get kind of swept away and it makes its way down to this trash gripper and it takes it out of the water and ensures we could divert maximum flows. Next slide. So the last thing is that we get our imported delivery when possible before our next rain event. So all these basins, the basin here, you can see the, it has uh, imported water in it. Those basins were cleaned and now we're taking imported water. So we took 3,000 in June of 2022. 
And then we also uh, were working on 22,000 more acre feet before uh, the next, uh, before we start to get rain. Now, we're at, we're at about a quarter of that already in the ground. So if, if we do see rain on the forecast, we will go ahead and cease our, our, our deliveries if we cannot manage it with our lower recharge system that was Santiago and Burr's pump station. So we'll operate that at full capacity before we uh, put any of that dirty water in our upper system. That helps us get all the imported water on the ground, but it also, uh, we're ready to go. So um, I think that's the next slide. So I just wanted to share a few photos that, uh, you know, we have resident bald eagles that uh, for the last 15 years have been, I first saw a bald eagle here about 15 years ago, and it was just a juvenile. It had, it didn't have any white on it. And the nesting pair in uh, Irvine Lake has been quite busy and uh, they produce quite a bit of offspring. And we'll see, uh, we actually have a tagged bald eagle that comes from, uh, it was tagged in Santa Rosa Island that has mated with one of our local bald eagles. So. Uh, one of the bird watchers that uh, frequents the area uh, sent me these photos that he took of the bald eagles at our facility. So I just thought I'd share those with you. And that's all I have, Ben. Thank you. Thank you so much, Don, and thank you, Ben, for um, for your great presentations. Um, we're going to um, jump into Q and A, but I wanted to just mention um, a couple interesting takeaways that that um, you all presented on. I, I thought it was really interesting that you know we we got to really see how water moves around and is stored in this part of the county. Um, you know, of course, we're um, our industry. We're working 24/7, 365, but there's sort of a time and place for certain operations and uh, particularly maintenance uh, activities that take place at, a, at strategic times of the year. And uh, we talked a lot about the variety of sources, you know, in our two dozen recharge basins, um, which is, of course is all part of our diversified water supply portfolio. So a lot of great um uh, a lot of great updates that you all shared with us today. And I just want to remind folks um, who are on the call, if you have any questions, uh, please do type them in the Q&A box and uh, we'll, we'll do our best to get to them all. And if you think of anything after the webinar as well, uh, please reach out to us. Uh, we can, you can email us at info at ocwd.com with your question or comment. So I wanted to uh, to start with a, a couple questions. Uh, one we received during the uh, registration process. So uh, Ben and Don, um, there's someone in the audience that uh, works in Orange County, in Costa Mesa in particular, lives in LA County, in Long Beach. Um, they're wondering, is there a level of cooperation between the two counties when it comes to aquifers that span across both counties? And specifically, they're asking, is there an equal focus sort of on, on balancing that stormwater capture while mitigating destructive flood damage? Um, sure. I'll, I'll start this one, Don. Uh, um, <clears throat> so yeah, the, just because humans came along and drew a line, uh, nature didn't draw a line in the aquifer, right? So the aquifer is connected between Orange County and LA. Um, Orange count sorry la has an adjudicated basin so uh, courts have assigned the different entities what they're entitled to whereas orange county luckily we haven't uh, faced that situation yet which gives us a lot more flexibility about how we manage um, so there is a little bit of finger pointing e each direction across the county line saying water's flowing to you now it's flowing to me and uh that is there. Uh, something we're working with them. We actually have a our hydrogeologists are working on a modeling and and trying to quantify. And it's probably might be flowing both directions, right? It's a long county line. There is also a joint project. It's called the Alamitos Barrier. Um, it's right by the San Gabriel River there, or between Seal Beach, Long Beach, and uh, that is injecting water in the ground to keep the ocean out uh, the seawater out and that is a joint project we 
we jointly pay for that. We are we have a long history there of working together to to protect the groundwater basin. So I would say mostly we work together um, as as best we can as separate public entities. Yeah, I, I could add just uh, just for the our 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 customers, right? Uh, we do only put water in as far as Raymond Basin. So that's kind of the line we've drawn to where we're ensuring that our water is going to our customers. So. Thank you both. And I'm just going to do a quick time check. I know it's 10.58. Ben and Don, are you okay to stay on for a couple more minutes to, uh, we got a couple questions here in the, in the box. Sure. Okay, great, great. And again, if we're not able to get to them, we'll make sure we provide written responses after. Uh, what happens to all the plastic that is collected in basins and pipes? Go ahead, Don. Uh, was the question plastics? Yes. Yeah, so all that, all that is accumulated in our trash racks. Uh, we, have, we have four trash racks and, or three trash rack systems. And then we have grading and all that ends up going to the landfill. We, we, we actually remove it from underneath the trash rack and we set it aside. We let it dry and, you know, all the water drain out of it and dry. And then we load it in a dump truck and it gets taken to the landfill. Great. Do these side slopes infiltrate too or just the basin inverts? Yes, the side slopes do, do uh, percolate, absolutely. And, uh, you know, the more surface ground to water surface area, the greater chance for percolation. So what happens with the basin, you put, say we put a little bit of water in the basin, it's going gonna, it's gonna to start to build storage. That's just natural. And then as soon as it finds equilibrium with the inflow to outflow, that means whatever's going in, it'll, go, it'll rise up. And as soon as it has enough space underground to go, it'll it'll become static. And then with Santa Ana River water, you'll see the clogging layer start to develop. And with that same inflow, all of a sudden the basin will rise up a little bit. And once again, it, it, it matches inflow to outflow, and then it gets clogged a little bit, and then it'll rise up. So you do get absolutely get percolation. And that's an advantage of the deep basins is you get the, the added sidewall, uh, the, the interface between the water and the ground, and also you get storage also. We do have middle, you know, medium-sized basins. That's what we're developing mostly now. And that's because they're easier to dewater and they're used less for storage, more for uh, percolation, get it offline, because it's you only have to vacate less water and then you could clean it faster and they get it back online, so. Thank you, Don. Uh, what are the effects of intense summer rainstorms on the basin, especially in terms of maintenance? And can you also touch on the building and maintaining, uh, maintenance of the TLN berms? Sure, sure. So the summer uh, storms that we have, typically they get absorbed right into the ground. It's pretty fast. At some of our basins, we will get run, you know, erosions because the banks are made out of, you know, the natural soil. So we will get erosions and those do get repaired before, uh, but we don't typically see the runoff accumulate as a pool or storage in the basins. Uh, and as far as what the second part of that was? Uh, building and maintenance of TNL berms. Yeah, so the TNL lev uh, berms, are built uh, primarily from Ball Road all the way down to Chapman Avenue. And those berms are built. It helps us absorb the, the during an event, it'll actually uh, allow for us to manage the water and then it'll extend. And then when our equipment is actually moving around and working in the river, we'll see that water recede back up you know and then they go away for the weekend and then we'll see the water go back down because where they were working is being clogged but as soon as they get back in there and re-stimulate and resuspend those silts the the uh the percolation increases and then and the, the water backs up 
I would just add those TNLs, they're made out of the sand in the river bottom and they're they're meant to wash out in any significant flow. And and once that dies down, then they we just rebuild them right away. Got it. Thank you. You know, we have a couple questions on um silts. Um, and it's it seems to be um kind of all asking where are the silts, where do the silts go after they're removed? So the um I'll take a turn. Thanks. The <laughs> The, uh, so we remove them with that scraper, right? And the first place they go is into a pile on the stockpile on the side of the basin. And we, um, they tend to stay there a long time until we can find somebody who wants it. Um, so every few years, a contractor will come through looking for material. You know, usually they want the good sandy stuff and we don't have a lot of that to spare. Uh, but typically we can work deals um, with these contractors and get them to take this material away. They they go mix it, whatever their uses are. Um, so it gets basically long-term storage. And then also we, we do seize opportunities for, we would get rid of it for free and the contractor would just work the material. Thank you. The, the county does uh, Miller Basin being a flood control basin. And it's uh, quite, um, that's an active basin that's used a lot. So when we do clean that flood control, they do reuse that that material. So we stockpile it and then they go ahead and reuse it for the county. Thank you both. Uh, Don, I think you touched on this in your slide. Um, how, how do you process the fish captured during the basin cleaning process? And do you get folks like fish and wildlife involved? Uh, no, these are these are in our recharge facilities, so uh, it's not anything to do with uh, fishing game at all. So what we do is our our fishing uh, leasey, they do try to capture as much uh, live fish as possible. So when we're down there and you see those dead fish, before that occurs, there's a lot of live fish that we're netting, and they come and they try to harvest as much as they can, and they'll take them to another lake that they're using, Anaheim Lake. So, but ultimately we end up with the dead fish. We go ahead and uh, use a conveyor system and put them in uh, a bin, a truck, uh, uh, a bin, and we have uh, a hazard that becomes hazardous material. And we have a contractor that takes them to a rendering plant and they, they use those fish for various, things. Got it. Um, what is the primary software you use for modeling the capture of stormwater? And I'm going to I'm going to tack on another question to that, the golden question of do we lose any water to the ocean? Sure. The, um, the main on it on a day to day, we're not using uh, software other than the SCADA, you know, the operational software. We do have a planning model for the recharge area. Uh, it's built on a platform called GoldSim. And years ago, it was uh, CH2M Hill built and programmed it. It's, um, <clears throat> you know, it, it models the conveyance of the water between the basins. And we can also put in there, what makes it really useful for us is we have decay models. So it can model the basin fouling, uh, the percolation rate dropping over time. And we can also plug in their storm patterns. And um, so it's it's really more of a planning model. It's used to analyze proposed changes or new facilities to the basin, to the whole basin system. Um, it's not a day-to-day -day, uh, modeling. So the day-to-day, -day, we just rely on the, the knowledge of, of Don and his group. Uh, we got several operators that really know the system well and, and are experienced and know how to uh, move the water around. The second part, do we lose water to the ocean? It, uh, yes, sometimes yes. Um, <clears throat> these storm patterns, as we know, are becoming more peaky. Um, so we do our best to grab what we can, but sometimes in those peaks, uh, flood concerns dominate and so we can lose water that way um 
so also if Prado Dam is receiving, you know, that big watershed up above Prado Dam, real large sustained storms, they will do large releases, you know, 5,000 CFS. Uh, we've seen recently, there's no way we can capture that uh, quantity and we have to deflate the dams when that much water comes down the river. So that being said, yes, but um, what it's probably been, we lost a little bit in December, um, but it's probably been a handful of years that what we could control, we lost anything. Is that right, Don? Yeah, so that's why it's so important for us to drain that pool, at the conservation pool at Prado, because uh, our, our number one goal is to drain the pool as fast as we can. That, uh, that minimizes those events where they have to do high releases for flood control purposes. But ultimately, at, at the end of each storm, it, it, ideally, we want to end with a full conservation pool. So we do lose water that, and you know, it's up for debate. It's below our last control point in the Santa Ana River. So we have some tributaries that come into our lower stretch of the Santa Ana River that uh, we could see high, high flows in those. At those times, we'll, we'll stop sending any water past our lowest control point and maximize the recharge of that water that ultimately would be lost. So we're minimizing what, what we would, you know, the water lost. That's great. You know, um, Ben, you talked about uh, measuring rain in, in Anaheim, uh, that there's a rain gauge we follow. So it rained yesterday uh, for a little bit. Uh, was that significant? Uh, when will we know how much rain, rain was recorded? Uh, Don probably knows right now, but I'm going to go ahead and say it was probably not notable in our in our area. Yeah, it wasn't quantitative. <laughs> so uh, that I think that storm that came through was more south of the Anaheim facilities. Um, so yeah, it was a smaller rainfall. Thank you. And I'll end on um, kind of a last couple of questions here. And, and again, if we're not able to provide a, a live response, we will um, provide a written response after the webinar. But I'm going to loop, loop a couple of these into, into one. Um, are there any concerns or, or challenges about um, you know, receiving uh, local urban or pollution from local urban runoff like areas from Anaheim? Um, or are there concerns about homeless issues? Yeah, so um, this you know, local runoff is from streets, right? And we we don't really know what's in it. These, this is uh, stormwater we're dealing with and we're not tr treating it before putting it in the lakes other than removing the large trash. So um, these, we do, uh, the water quality department at OCWD does some monitoring of those storm flows. Um, but basically we're relying on earth, the, the mother earth to treat the water. Um, when it goes in the ground, it's going through a huge sand filter, right? The aquifers. Um, and it's, we're recharging into the shallow aquifer. Most of the drinking water is drawn out of the principal, hundreds of feet lower under, a, under an aquitard. So there is a lot of treatment nature does in the ground before it reaches a drinking water supply. Um, the homeless, we, we, I try to be careful how I say it right. The, they are present in some of our facilities. We have 24 hour security. We have video cameras. Um, we are very active in requesting them to move out. I would say we don't, we haven't had encampments. Uh, a few years ago, the city of Anaheim had, and the county of Orange had several encampments around, but they weren't on our facilities because we're very proactive um, at in, encouraging those folks to, to find other locations. And final question, um, kind of thinking ahead, are there any plans to modify uh, operations and maintenance to maximize recharge in the future in light of climate change, changing conditions? Um, yeah, we we do have some plans. Um, we 
not currently considering buying any land, but uh, for additional lakes. The, the challenge there is we could use a lake, you know, maybe one month a year, maybe three months out of the year. Another nine months, it could sit um, idle, right? A, a, a moonscaped uh, hole in the ground. We're not, not too pleasant for residents. And um, so there's this balance between uh, limited uses and, and sitting idle. <clears throat> We also uh, we're working with the Army Corps to increase that pool elevation that they can store. Uh, that is actively being pursued. I'm I would expect in the next five years or so we get an elevation increase up there. Uh, so that will greatly help you know capture those peaky type events. Um, and then down in our basins. Uh, we're very flexible, right? Where the water can go and when, and we just do our best to prepare as soon as we, like we started preparing in, in February for October, November, right? We, we're we always preparing, even if we don't expect something coming, we try to be ready for it because the unexpected does, does come. Thank you. So expect the unexpected and we're always ready. That's a, those are great closing comments then. Um, I, I, you know, I think we, we've got to wrap it up, but uh, I'm going to try and um, make sure we, um, we get to these questions um, certainly after the webinar, but I just wanted to thank you again, Ben and Don, for uh, your great presentations, for staying on a little bit longer as well uh, to answer uh, these questions. Uh, you can see there's quite a bit of interest uh, in the entire operations and um, We'll, we'll be in touch with, uh, with with questions that we have for you afterwards as well. So thank you very much. And to our attendees again, thank you so much for joining today. Uh, if you do have any questions uh, after the fact, uh, please email us at info at ocwd.com. And just a final reminder that this webinar is being recorded and it will be available on OCWD's website and YouTube channel. So thank you very much. Have a great day. Thank you.